headphones on. Can everyone hear me okay? Mm -hmm. uh, well, first I just want to thank, uh, thank everyone for the opportunity to be able to share um, some of our experiences at Caremore with this group. I think, um, I think what we're working on today is obviously really exciting and I look forward to hearing this group's feedback and energy and ideas on, on what we're doing uh, where I work currently as well as for the, for the greater greater productivity of how we're managing CQD in the country. So I just want to give a very brief background on Caremore, uh, not to take away from what we're really trying to accomplish today, uh, but I often find if people don't know where we're coming from, then it's hard to understand what we're trying to contribute. Um, so Caremore's um, goal has been in the space of trying to achieve really outstanding care to follow through. And so that side of the care delivery system in combination with the care centers that do chronic disease management both interact in a way to proactively identify patients who need um, a different way of, of being treated and, and sort of a higher level of attention because while we like to say on one end that, oh, well, every patient should get same access to care, there's also another notion that I would like to introduce, which is uh, patients who are more complicated will need a different level of attention. And that doesn't mean that everyone doesn't have access to care, but we should be thinking about different types of patients with different priorities and different attention to uh, detail. So, uh, so what are some of the resources around chronic disease management? Uh, it's, it's basically a large interdisciplinary team uh, of nurse practitioners, clinical partners, patient navigators, dietitians, social workers, and remote monitoring programs for, um, for hypertension and, and diabetes and, and CHF volume management. Uh, we have a specialized clinical team for advanced CKD and ESRD. So all those components that I'm describing, we have one subset of it focused on taking care of the advanced chronic kidney disease and, and ESRD population. Uh, and there, you know, the focus is still on the same things that it would be for every other chronic disease uh, management. What are we trying to accomplish with, uh, with our management and kidney health? I think these goals pretty much align with everything we're going to talk about today as a group and that we already have begun to discuss. Uh, first and foremost, it's really about how are we elevating the quality of life for, for the patients who have kidney disease or are at risk for it. Um, and it always comes back to improving health literacy, which I know will resonate strongly with everyone here. Um, because if there is not enough literacy about the, about the disease to begin with, uh, having change happen in a meaningful way both on the provider side as well as on the patient side becomes pretty much impossible. Um, increasing the proportion of well-planned kidney replacement therapy um, and really uh, moving away from the default being hemodialysis, particularly in center hemo, um, that is um, a huge flaw of the way the system has been set up over many decades and something uh, that will require many more techniques of work to resolve. Um, addressing elevating functional status, proactively setting therapeutic goals so that we're really delivering care that matches what a patient desires and, and that providers feel really good about delivering as well. Uh, there's a morale problem in the nephrology side that at least I'll speak to as, as a nephrologist myself. Uh, we don't often feel like we're in a position to really give patients what, uh, what we'd like to. And a lot of that has to do with meeting them too far downstream in their disease. Um, and then, of course, integrating and streamlining how we deliver outpatient care. By the time a patient ends up uh, with ESRD, uh, there's so many different uh, people and departments involved in their care. And how do you how do you keep everybody together humming as one team so that a patient has a smooth, consistent, not confusing experience? Um, so, at Caremore, we're looking at doing um, population health management across the total disease spectrum. And so that starts with subclinical CKD all the way through end of life. And really, uh, I think it's incomplete if the whole thing isn't considered at once. And so that has been one of the bigger clinical pushes uh, in our organization to, to look at this as a, as a continuum, <coughs> as a spectrum. Um, subclinical CKD is uh, I'm referring to specifically less than stage three disease. Because at that point, 
do people even really need to know they have it? That's that's a topic of, of discussion that, that I hope we address today. Um, because there is, we've learned from um, prostate cancer screening, breast cancer screening, colorectal cancer screening, that there is, we have to find the right point of when is screening appropriate versus anxiety provoking and not contributing to, to health outcomes in a, in a meaningful way. So I think the same uh, <coughs> challenge will need to be solved for CKD. So how do we identify CKD at Caremore? There's an annual health assessment that this is part of our health plan side of things. And so that gives us the perfect opportunity to get a GFR on every patient and also get a microalbuminuria testing. So for, uh, for over 75% of our membership across all markets, we will have at least one data point on, on both of those tests. Um, and then there's PCP referrals, um, referrals from the other disease management programs. So if somebody's engaged in diabetes care, and the NP who's following them for diabetes is like, oh, you know, we should we should uh, we should make sure you're also educated about and, and supported in your CKD. So there will be that sort of internal referrals as well. And we also do analytics-based outreach, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But from the from the side of having all the lab data available, we're able to say, okay. In, um, in this uh, geography of Southern California, we have 400 people who have a GFR of 30 or less. What's, what's our plan for engaging them or, or making sure they are getting the care they need? Um, so low-risk CKD and high-risk CKD, uh, the, there's not, I don't think in the literature, really robust evidence in terms of uh, where to make this cutoff, and so our best guess is, is honestly what this is, and uh, and so low risk CKD is stage three, stage three A, three B, um, and high risk CKD is stage four and worse, uh, but also including three B patients who have heavy proteinuria, so two grams or more, um, and. For everyone who falls into the high-risk category, we have a systematic process to, to recommend or ensure that a, a referral to a nephrologist happens. The flip side of that is then making sure that the appointment actually happens, not just that the visit is scheduled. So that part, that, that follow-through part is still, uh, I can't say it's perfect at this point. Um, if there is progression, then at some point we have to talk about what the ESRD transition looks like. and. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people have different ideas on this, but what I want to emphasize is that this is the key place where we can really educate patients about um, all their different options and really empower them to make the right decision for uh, improving or continuing their quality of life at the standard that is suitable for them and their families and consistent with their values. So transplant, of course, uh, home dialysis, uh, PD especially, um, and conservative management, which I know we, we talked about a little bit briefly before. Uh, when we talk about modality education, all of these have to be discussed, and all of them have to be presented. Um, and conservative management comes into one of the modalities that we offer and should be consistently discussed. That doesn't mean, of course, that we say to a patient who's 50 years old that we want to do conservative management. but is it still worthwhile to explain to a 50-year-old that this is the spectrum of options that we think about for every patient who has advanced kidney disease? Yes, it's part of that transparency and, uh, and uh, complete trust in, in the provider-patient relationship that we will give you all the information and help you also make a decision that is consistent with what we know will be best for your life. Um, so. We, we support through all modality selection and then, of course, palliation end of life. Uh, the kidney, uh, kidney clinician team at Caremore, the, the nurse practitioners, are trained in palliative care, but we also have a palliative care program that separately augments and, and supports um, patients who may have different needs or, or more intense needs towards the end of life. Um, so I think I actually already touched on this, and so in the, for the sake of time, I'll skip this. But the, bo the, the main idea is, right, we have to think about how to manage upstream um, and think about primary prevention. Renal language really means type management of comorbidities. I'm um, preaching to the choir. Um, and then thinking about how to smartly, uh, transparently, and respectfully uh, support and manage the patients who are transitioning to, to ESRD or who are at high risk of transition to ESRD. So uh, what does the CKD membership at Caramore look like and, and what are we measuring? Um, so this, I apologize, it's a pretty jammed slide, but 
uh, hopefully it gives you a sense of how many different things we're trying to think about. Um, so the first thing is uh, define the cohort, right? Who, who are these people? Um, so to qualify uh, in this set of metrics, we wanted to have two EGFR values, less than 60, at least three months apart, um, to feel confident that we're identifying CKD in, a, in an appropriate way. Um, and then CKD epi uh, was used for the staging uh, classification. Um, we excluded everybody who was in our ESRD special needs plan or had a CMS uh, coding for ESRD. Uh, and then, okay, well then, what are the baseline characteristics of the patients who then qualify by, by those standards? Um, we want to look, of course, at the basic obvious demographics, age, gender, ethnicity, BMI, uh, preferred language, sorry, um, percent with certain comorbidities, um, percent who are both Medicare and Medicaid eligible because that will point to a different set of needs, um, different set of socioeconomic circumstances, uh, smoking history, substance abuse, active or historical. And then uh, we want to be looking at process measures uh, that then also feed into clinical outcomes. And there's a subset that's specific for our more high-risk CKD patients, and then a broader group of, of things that will apply to anyone at any stage of, of CKD, and arguably to patients with a lot of other chronic diseases as well. Um, so uh, we had mentioned somebody else, I think, I think Todd maybe had mentioned the uh, issue of coding. So of course you want to take a look at to see, are we coding as consistently as we're identifying CKD by labs? Um, percent on statin therapy, percent on um, RAS inhibition, um, and seeing what, how their partner area is doing at the same time. Um, obviously wanting to eliminate people who are on dual therapy as there's harm associated with that. Uh, so I won't go into details, but things that make sense that we could uh, modify from the health system standpoint in terms of how clinical care is delivered, and then outcomes which result from these things hopefully happening more consistently. So outcomes would be things like good blood pressure control, uh, good diabetes control, uh, looking at mortality, looking at mortality specifically due to cardiovascular disease, like Dr. Basilati said earlier this morning, uh, the majority of CKD mortality is due to cardiovascular disease. So that's the more feared outcome than ESRD progression. Uh, and then looking at hospital uh, metrics as well, uh, admit rates, ER visit rates, readmission. Uh, so I just wanted to share a few sample numbers um, for our CKD cohort. Our membership is a little less than 10,000 for stages one through five. The high risk, notably, is much less, um, 1,300 and change. Uh, just for total reference, oh, sorry, total reference, um, total membership is 80,000, and so <coughs> CKD is accounting for 12 and change percent which is a little bit less than what we're seeing in the epidemiology nationwide. Um, I wanted to point out that the average age is, is in the late 70s. Um, and I didn't put it on this slide, but the average age of an ESRD member at Caremore is 65. So I, I hope that generates some discussion for us later today, because the thing to think about is, why do we, so how clinically significant is CKD in somebody who's in their 70s? And how are we going to approach the topic of patients who are far younger progressing to ESRD? So what is really going to be the approach to prevention? We really do have to think about factors that are contributing to early disease manifestations. And a lot of that will have to do, I suspect, with the social determinants of health. Um, so I look forward to, to us brainstorming on that. Um, the other numbers I think are pretty predictable. Uh, obesity, I keep pressing the forward rather than the laser. Obesity is, as you would expect, um, high amount of hypertension, high amount of diabetes, and diabetes uh, rises up a little bit as you have more advanced CKD. Um, a decent amount of depression, and I suspect that's uh, underdiagnosed, so a quarter of our patients, but. I would guess it's closer to 50%, if not even more in some subsets. Um, and uh, goals of care conversations, and this is uh, a proxy right now because what I'd really like us to be tracking, uh, hopefully sometime in the near future, is the number of patients who've had discussions about ESRD transition. 
uh, not for stages one through five, but for the high risk part of the population. And so in substitution of that, having goals of care conversation hopefully partially starts to address the transition um, issues. Uh, so well, what do we do with all this data, right? Data is nice to have, but then next steps. Um, we can look at program engagement similar to what uh, Todd was describing. Uh, he's been doing it in his company. And uh, we do this by tracking clinic visitations with the patients who qualify for, for the CKD programs. Um, and then looking at those clinical outcomes that I had on a couple of slides earlier, the point of that is to really have a registry-like capacity. And then we can, we've already started to give feedback at different levels, right? Going all the way down granular to the patient. Um, so I can go to our Las Vegas team and say, okay, here in this market, this is our spread of advanced CKD. This is the percent of our patients who have advanced CKD who've been referred to nephrologists. How are we doing on proportion of patients who are referred for PD catheter replacement versus HD? Um, we can do this at a provider level, both by contracted nephrologist as well as internal care work providers, the nurse practitioners, um, and then at the patient level to then just actually make care plan changes based on what's happening to each person. Uh, and this also uh, gives us the luxury of then making operational changes, uh, like I was alluding to, with saying, okay, well. We have, uh, we have one segment of the market in SoCal that uh, statin therapy is less than 50% in the patients who have CKD stages three and four. Why is that? What are the prescribing patterns and clinicians practice patterns that we need to impact and modify and, and do targeted uh, changes in that way? So I'll stop there. Thank you.